Hello, in this video I want to talk about three things that can help you improve your solo practice. Eating the frog, having a plan, and self-imposed pressure. So if those things are of interest, stay tuned. One of the things that uh, I really want to accomplish with my YouTube channel here is to encourage more people to practice on their own. And I want to encourage them to do it, do it regularly, and do it properly. And um, I've got lots of ideas to do that, but one of the things that I want to do is to make sure that when you're on court, you're using the time effectively. So the first thing that we're going to talk about today is called eating the frog. I've stolen this idea from the business community. Essentially, eating the frog is doing the task that you really don't want to do, but you know you should. Not that you should eat frogs, but um, it's the idea that you've got this task that you have to do. Let's think in business first of all. You've got to call this customer. You've got to talk to this particular person. You've got to do this project. You've got to finish this particular um, task. But you don't want to do it. You've been delaying it. You don't do it because you don't like it, because for many reasons. Well, it's the same with uh, hitting the ball. What you tend to find is if I were to video hundreds of thousands of people doing their solo practice, well, probably hundreds of people more likely, um, they'd probably do the things that they're good at, the things that they enjoy, and they're probably good at them because they enjoy them. So you do more, so you often see people hitting those figure of eights because they're really good at them and they really love them. What you need to do is you need to do the exercises first that you're not very good at. The shot that you're weaker, and you need to do that for a number of reasons. You need to do it first because it gets it out of the way. What tends to happen is if you say, oh, I'll do that at the end, oh, I'm a bit tired today, oh, okay, I'll do it next, next time I'm on court. You don't. Do it first. Get it done. That action of doing it first will give you a feeling of, yeah, I've accomplished something today. Even if the rest of my day isn't particularly productive, I've actually managed to accomplish something today. And that's where the business idea comes in. That's what people used to do. So you do it first and you do more of it. So if there's a particular thing that you're weak on, I don't know, high backhand service returns, you do more of them than you might do on your forehand. If you think about any professional sportsman, it's unusual to think that they have a weaker side when it comes to like racket sports or you know hitting. Sure, they've probably got one shot that's really good, like Nadal's forehand is maybe better than his backhand, but his backhand is still freaking awesome. Okay, and what you want to do as a player, you want to be balanced as possible. You don't want any obvious weakness because your opponent will exploit that or they should be exploiting it. And you should be exploiting, exploiting your opponent's weaknesses. So if you can reduce the number of weaknesses you've got, that'll make it harder for them to, to play against you. So do the worst exercise or the exercise that you're not very good at first and do more of them and that's really important. Now I can't tell you what that is, I'm sure you'd love me to say, oh you need to do this, but I don't know. I, I, I've never seen you, so you'll have to decide, you and your coach, you and your mates, you and a, a video camera that you've used to watch yourself play, but do it and make sure it's first. So that's the first one, eat the frog. The next one is have a plan. If you've seen my Facebook page, the kind of header image at the time of making this video is my ghosting plan that I used maybe two or three years ago. Every time I go on court, especially when I'm hitting the ball or I'm ghosting, it's not because, well, what shall I do today? Oh, I just, you know, no. I've got a plan. Just the same as any time work that you do, you have a plan, you use that time better that way. You're more productive. So, again, I'm sure you're expecting me to say to you, these are the things that you need to do. But, you know, as Hashim said in his book like 50 years ago, he said, I, I can't coach somebody that I don't know. Well, he didn't say that. He said, this is the first time I'm coaching somebody I've never met. But you get the point. That I can't tell you exactly what things that you need to do. You probably just need to do a bit of everything plus the things that you're not very good at and maybe one thing that you want to really, really be good at. But have that plan. I'm going to hit 100 of these and 50 of these and 20 of these and 50 of those. Have the plan and you will adapt it. The first time it won't be very good because it will be too many shots or it won't be enough and it'll take too long or it'll take you know less time than you expect. But don't worry. Start with a plan, a written plan. A little bit of masking tape, stick it on the back door so that you know what you're doing until it becomes like a habit. And you will really feel as though that you're working hard. Maybe even tick them off every time you've done them. Depends on you know how it works. So that's it. Have a plan. And if necessary, 
um, book a court with a friend, and if it's like a 40 minute court, you have 20 minutes and he or she can have 20 minutes. Do it that way. Um, because one of the things I want to uh, emphasize here is that more people should practice on their own. It's not something that you do just because your, your opponent is like 10 minutes late. It's not something you do because you haven't got anybody to play with. You do it because it's really good for you. If I had the choice with my students, what I would force them to do, force them, yes, I would force them that instead of every four sessions that they practice with somebody, at least one of those sessions would be on their own. Ideally, they would be practicing every day, but you know, this is, you know, this is real work. You know, we're not talking about professionals, but don't think of solo practice as just something you do because you, don't, you can't do anything else. You should see it as a separate individual session on its own that brings its own benefits. As a squash community, we are so lucky that we can practice on our own. You don't see tennis players practicing on their own. Okay, maybe they can practice their serve. Same as table tennis players. Well, okay, table tennis players can kind of do the table in half. But I don't know whether really good table tennis players need to do that because maybe that, that's not representative of a real game. But squash players can. Sorry, get off track there. Squash players can. You can do so many different exercises. And again, I can't tell you which ones, but I will. But I can't tell you which ones that you need, but you do those exercises. Get on court. It's really useful for you. Right, okay. And the last one, self-imposed pressure. One of the things that we don't do enough is we don't put ourselves under pressure when we're practicing. Practice is often a, just a chance to you know, uh, improve certain areas. And I'm not suggesting that all practice needs to be uh, under pressure. But when you're on court, you should be trying to recreate a situation that's similar to the matches. Now, here's an example. What I do is I get on court and either with a cold ball, because that's quite useful as well, or with a warm ball. I get to the front of the court, I'm starting on the forehand side, about a meter and a half to two meters away, and I hit 60 forehand straight volleys. And then when I've done 60, I go into the corner and I hit 60 corner shots. And then when I've done those, I go into the middle of the court, same distance from the front wall, and I hit from the front wall, forehand, backhand, forehand, backhand, forehand, backhand. And then I move across, and I'm sure you've guessed it, I do 60 in the corner, and then when I've done that, I do 60 backhand straights. Now here's the kicker. If I make a mistake, I go back to the beginning. Not the beginning of the exercise I'm doing, the beginning, the forehand straight volleys. And this will begin to impose pressure. And I can tell you the first four exercises are not easy, easy, but they're much easier than you might expect. Boom, 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 boom. When you get to the last one, there's a little bit of nerves there. When that ball starts to get close to the wall, and that's important, those two exercises begin and end with balls close to the wall, because that's what's going to happen in a real game. That's where you're most likely to make the mistakes. You're most likely to make the mistakes at the beginning or at the end. So as you're hitting these balls along the wall, you're gonna be a little bit nervous because when you get to like 35, 45, 50 and 50, you start to think, oh no, please, I don't wanna make a mistake. A little bit like you do in a real game. And then you do, oh, poop. And you have to go back to the beginning. It's a great way of imposing pressure. Now I'm not suggesting that you have to do 60. 60 is not particularly difficult. Start with 10. It doesn't even have to be that exercise that I've just explained to you, but everybody likes a real example. What I want you to do though, is have the plan and the pressure. Now, you might be um, a beginner, in which case you can just hit 10 forehand straight drives before the uh, short line, which is the line on the floor. When you do that, then you hit forehand and a backhand, 10 of those. When you do those, you hit 10 backhand straight shots. That's not particularly difficult, but it can be if you're a beginner, and if you make a mistake, you go back to the beginning. You can create all sorts of different exercises for this, but what's important is that you must go back to the beginning. And you could limit yourself. You could say, I'm gonna have five tries, depends on how long that each one is. So I mean, if, if you like, you're at 100 shots for each exercise, then five tries will take quite a while. But that can be quite useful. But I want you to be nervous when you're practicing some of these exercises. Because if you're not nervous, you're not really maximizing the time. You're doing the physical aspects, but every single practice you do, every single thing you do should have some mental component. It should, because every time you play squash, there is a mental component in there somewhere. 
So that's another one of my objectives for this channel, is to s introduce more and more ideas about the mental aspects of the game. I'm not an expert, I'm not a sports psychologist, but I've got enough experience to, to give you some starts, uh, starting exercises and starting ideas. So let's summarize. Number one, eat the frog. Do the things that you don't like doing. Do the things that you're not very good at. Do the things that you um, need to improve. Do them first and do them more. Number two, have a plan. Try to write it down. I'm going to do this number. Over time, you'll get better at making those plans. And you can have different plans for sort of different times, days of the week or different times of the year. And you can keep them. You can laminate them. You can put them on the wall. And you can use them. You can share them with your friends. Three. Impose some pressure on yourself. Make a mistake, you go back to the beginning. Okay, so those are the three areas. And the final thing to remind you is that I really want to impress upon you how important it is to find, make time to get on court on your own. Don't do it because you've got nothing else to do. Do it because it is an essential part of improving. You can improve faster by getting on court on your own. So hopefully those things have been useful for you. Thanks for watching. And remember, do something every single day to improve your squash. See ya.